The famous Protestant reformer Martin Luther once said that justification is the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. And that sentiment has been echoed by countless theologians and church leaders in the centuries since. What is the doctrine of justification and why is it so important? My guest today is Matthew Barrett, and in our conversation, he sheds light on the meaning of justification by faith alone, explaining why it's so central to the Christian faith. Along the way, he engages with the claim that evangelicals often overemphasize justification to the detriment of other doctrines, and he explores why the book of James says that we're not justified by faith alone. Matthew Barrett is an associate professor of Christian theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary as well as the founder and executive editor of Credo Magazine and the host of the Credo Podcast. He's the author of several books, including The Doctrine on Which the Church Stands or Falls, Justification in Biblical, Theological, Historical, and Pastoral Perspective from Crossway. Let's get started. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for joining me today on the Crossway Podcast. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we're going to be talking about the doctrine of justification. And it's one of those doctrines that uh, if you've been a Christian for a long time or have studied theology to any level, you know that this is a really important doctrine for our faith as Protestant Christians. Uh, and so we're going to get into a lot of different facets of this doctrine. But maybe to start us off, how would you summarize the doctrine of justification if you were talking to a non Christian who isn't very familiar with the Christian faith? Well, I think the first thing I would say would actually not be about justification itself. Hmm. Obviously, we want to get there. But in order to get there, I think the first thing we have to talk about is God. And I think the first thing I would want to say to someone who's not a Christian is, do you understand that the God who made you in his image is a God who is absolutely, perfectly unchangeably holy. And that means that this God is set apart. Uh, there is a difference between you as a creature and him as the creator. But it also means that this God, as the God who is set apart, is a God uh, who's like no, no other. Uh, there is none like him. And part of what that means is that his holiness is a righteous holiness. And we see that righteousness displayed in the law that he gave to his people. The tragedy of it all, though, is that every single one of, of us, uh, no, no one is an exception here, uh, every single one of us has not lived in communion with God, but we have actually broken his law and we have done so it, out of a heart of idolatry. And so this is not a minor thing. Uh, it's not some cold, abstract violation of some law. But when we break God's law, we are actually committing cosmic treason. We are violating the very character of God himself and er all the goodness and blessedness he intended for us. And so that puts us in a terrible predicament. Uh, we stand before holy God as those who are unrighteous, as those who are transgressors. And because of our transgression, we therefore deserve condemnation. This is a legal verdict in which we are declared guilty before him. And the consequences uh, are everlasting because he is a God who himself is eternal and infinite. So that's the, the terrible news. What is then the good news of the gospel? Uh, and, and I think this is where justification starts to come in, starts to beam into this darkness. Well, every single one of us is a child of Adam. And so when Adam sinned in the garden, uh, he represented us. Uh, he was our father. And that's really hard for us to get our minds around today. Because we're not used to, we're not used to, we're very, we like to think of ourselves as individuals. Mm. But it the Bible seems speaks, unfair. It seems unfair. But the Bible doesn't entertain that type of objection. It says you are either one of two persons. You are either in Adam or you are in Christ, period. And so in Adam, all of humanity 
is then in Adam and all of humanity then, well, Adam's guilt is then imputed to all of humanity so that we stand under his legal condemnation. And as a result, we also receive from Adam then his corrupt or polluted nature, which means that we not only have this condemning legal verdict over our heads because we are children of Adam, but the very inclinations of our heart, our mind, our will, uh, our total person, in fact, is inclined towards evil and our nature, to use more theological language, our nature is corrupt. Well, the good news is that there is a second Adam who has come, and this is none other than the Son of God himself. Who could have uh, imagined this? The Father sent his only begotten Son, as maybe some have heard from childhood, right? John 3.16. Uh, what love is this? That, that the Father would give his only begotten Son to be incarnate. Uh, in, in John's gospel, he says, he uses the language of made flesh, to humble himself so low to the point of death on the cross. What do we see in Christ, the second Adam? Well, he comes not only one who pays the penalty for our sins, suffering for our sake, but there's also a positive side to this as well. He lives for our sake. Now, we not only transgress the law, but we fail to keep the law. Well, Christ, from the very beginning of his ministry, comes, and he's very clear he has come to fulfill all righteousness. So yes, he's going to suffer the penalty we deserve, but he's also going to fulfill all righteousness. So that at the end of the day, by means of his life, death, and resurrection, we can't forget the resurrection here, his righteousness, his perfect obedience to the law. Well, that is actually counted to us. It is credited to us. It is reckoned to us so that upon faith, God declares us. who We are ungodly, but upon faith in Christ, not in ourselves, but upon faith in Christ, we, have, we receive this amazing declaration that we are righteous in Jesus Christ, in the second Adam. So this, this is the best news of all. And uh, we can talk more about what that means, but as you can probably tell, if we are condemned in Adam, now we are declared righteous in Adam, in, in Christ, not because we are actually righteous, as if our works somehow uh, make us righteous, but rather God has declared us righteous on account of what his son has accomplished. Mm. So Martin Luther, the famous Protestant reformer who lived you know, 500 years ago, he called justification, quote, the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. I wonder if you could unpack for us, what did he mean by that when he said that? And do you agree with that sentiment? That is how central this doctrine is to the Christian faith. Yes. Well, there's all kinds of fascinating historical discussion. You know, where does this language come from, the doctrine in which the church stands or falls? It seems to be the case that the actual phrase comes much, much later than the Reformation. It's a bit more modern and contemporary. But more to your question, I think the, ins the issue of centrality is a complicated one. At first glance, it might not seem so, but, but it is complicated. And, and here's what I mean. On the one hand, we must say, yes, justification is a right understanding of justification is absolutely central. And this is what the reformers are after, because here we are talking about how are we right with God? And the storyline of scripture, well, that gets right at the heart of it. And, and uh, that's the type of question that, as we know, affects everything from our pre present status before God to our eternal destination. At the same time, though, and the Reformers uh, articulated this as well, at the same time, they also understood that in order to argue for this doctrine of justification, they couldn't just focus on soteriology or one aspect of it. Even that very brief, superficial description of justification that I gave as we started, well, it assumes a whole lot. It assumes uh, certain things about the attributes of God. Uh, it, assur it assumes a certain Christology. And then once those things are properly in place, uh, it then takes us to a certain understanding of how we then are the recipients 
of God's grace. All that to say, on the one hand, it's absolutely central, uh, the doctrine in which the church stands or falls. On the other hand, though, it's not the only doctrine. And so even in soteriology, we need to recognize, well, in order to have a proper understanding of justification, uh, there are many other aspects of soteriology that we have to pay attention to and we have to get right. Everything from regeneration to sanctification. You know, what is the difference between justification and sanctification to adoption to, we could go, we could span this out further to talk about election and predestination to the very character of God. Mm. So I, I just mentioned that because I know that sometimes Christians today, in, in out of a good intention, can really focus on justification. But unfortunately, we, we sometimes do so without this broader perspective of, well, what else needs to is foundational so that we can even talk about it? Yeah, because I think that's one critique that I've heard, particularly of Protestants and even more specifically kind of the Reformed ilk, is that, yeah, that we can be so concerned with justification as, yes, a litmus test for true theology, good theology, or we can even sort of start to equate it with the gospel itself, that uh, yes. the doctrine of justification is the gospel or and vice versa. Um, do you and think maybe there's... we should address that, right? Yeah. Because yeah. when we talk about the gospel, at least this is how I would phrase things. We have to be really careful here because the gospel is something objective, something that is that has happened in history. Jesus Christ lived, died, rose again as our Lord and as our King and as our Savior, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about the gospel, uh, we need to be clear. We're not talking about how I feel or how you feel or how I reacted or how you reacted. As important as those things may be, we're actually talking about uh, something objective, which is the incarnation of the Son of God and all that he accomplished for our salvation and what that means for Christ as pro our prophet, priest, and king. So there's a lot there we can talk about in terms of the gospel. When we talk about justification, we are at, then asking the question of, well, how is the grace of this gospel then ours? How do we become, how do we be, become the recipients so that we receive this great blessing and all the riches that Christ has accomplished for us? And that's where we move from salvation accomplished by Christ to how the Holy Spirit then works this salvation for us and within us. And that brings us not to just justification, but to a whole whole sweep of doctrines that we call the, the order of salvation from regeneration all the way to glorification. Mm. So all that to say, sometimes when we talk about justification and the gospel, usually I know what people mean. They're trying to say, if you get justification wrong, that puts us at risk because we could then be misunderstanding the gospel. At the same time, though, we just have to make sure we're distinguishing between the two so that we don't just collapse everything into justification itself and uh, turn the gospel into, into our experience. Yeah, that's such a helpful uh, distinction there. And I think it, it does underscore in my mind the importance of these terms that we use. And this is where, in my experience, Good theology and good theological discussion and understanding can really help us to to distinguish, make these in, important distinctions that keep, keep us thinking straight about some of these doctrines that are interrelated and do impact one another. So let's talk about the Bible's teaching on this doctrine. I think it's safe to say the Apostle Paul has the most to say explicitly about the doctrine of justification in the New Testament. Uh, he uses his famous phrase that we're justified by faith and not by works. He contrasts those two things pretty consistently throughout his epistles. Uh, but then in James 2, we read the Apostle James writing that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, uh, a statement that actually led Martin Luther, of all people, to call the book of James an epistle of straw, and he denigrated it, didn't think it was maybe as authoritative or inspired as other epistles. So uh, is the Bible contradictory on this doctrine? Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> we all Which kind I, of expected I, that, but maybe you can help <laughs> us understand why. Well, yeah. We have to remember when we are talking about the Bible that, yes, it is written by many human authors from very divergent backgrounds at points, but there is one divine author, and his divine authorial intent transcends uh, the trees to span the whole forest 
in a way that gives us the ability to open the scriptures and uh, read the scriptures as a unit, as a whole, as an organic whole, uh, one in which God's plan of redemption is seen from beginning to end. So we have to make sure that we are reading the Bible theologically in that sense. Uh, if we throw out those basic foundational assumptions, then yes, I, I, and many scholars have done this, they will go to a James and say, well, this is completely contrary to what Paul says, and they're fine with that. So that's the first thing we need to note is that uh, actually we can affirm a unity because of the divine author. But the second thing I, I would notice is that we, if we do good exegesis and pay attention to context, I think we see that Paul and James are not necessarily disagreeing with each other, but rather trying to address uh, address different issues in different contexts. We oftentimes do this uh, in the church. Right? So if you're a pastor in the local church, for example, and you have, maybe you're a new pastor and, and you're inheriting an older church and you discover after you know that honeymoon of pastoral bliss, <laughs> you suddenly discover, oh no, uh, there's actually a, a number of people in my congregation who think they can live however they want because at some point in time, maybe a long time ago, they said a sinner's prayer or they walked an aisle or they confessed faith in Christ or whatever they did, and they see no conflict at all with uh, living in a very ungodly way, well, something's gone wrong. And of course, that's, you know, no one could relate to this today, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in James, not that this, that's the same context that, that we see in the book of James, but the point is, James is very concerned in his context that some assume that works are completely irrelevant it's what it means to, to be a Christian and to follow Christ. And this is very disturbing to James. And so he's going to use very strong language. I think understood rightly, uh, James is not trying to say uh, you are right with God on the basis of your words. I think what he's trying to say is if you have actually been declared right with God, then the, the fruit that absolutely necessarily comes out of that new standing, well, is the fruit of good works. And in other words, I think James is saying to them, if you really are a new creation in Christ, why would you not, why would you not live like Christ? This is no different than what the reformers actually said. Isn't it interesting that when they defended the doctrine of justification by faith alone, they had to turn right around and clarify, oh, we are, we are not actually denying the fruit of justification, which is good works, but we need to understand it in its proper place, uh, not as the basis or means to justification, but as a fruit of justification, apart from which, yeah, the, someone like James in his context has every right to question the validity of their faith to begin with. Hmm. That's such a helpful reminder that as we come to Scripture to read and interpret what it says, we do need to come with that confidence in its inspiration and inerrancy. And, and also with the commitment to letting Scripture help us to understand other parts of Scripture, to holding it all together. Um, I do wonder, I think some people might hear that explanation and, and okay, it makes sense, but maybe still wonder, or have questions in their mind, why would God, uh, especially for a doctrine like justification that is so central to our understanding of how it is that we are saved, which is that core focus of the Bible, why would God choose to have two different authors express maybe different facets of the same doctrine or of, a, of the broader salvation that we're experiencing in such similar and yet seemingly contradictory ways. So <laughs> I know that's kind of a, a, it's kind of a speculative question, but have you ever wrestled with that? Like, why would he even have James use the same phrase that Paul uses, essentially, justified by faith, and, and say, no, it's not just that, when Paul has already said, yes, it is just that? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, in one sense, the perspective we take is quite crucial, isn't it? Because we could also look at it as God's gracious accommodation to his church. What do I mean? Well, in Paul, 
we see someone who is given his background. He is, God has well equipped him. Uh, he knows the law like none other. And so God has well equipped him then to be confrontational when you have this very volatile period in which Jews are coming to very disagreeable opinions over whether works of the law then play a part in justification. And so Paul is well equipped at that point. God has prepared him to answer that question. And so he can he can speak without reservation, without hesitation, and say, no, absolutely not. You cannot be justified by works of the law, which is going to really offend those who are who are clinging to the law in some way. At the same time, though, God is very gracious in the context of James to give us a different individual to address a different situation. Uh, and so this is sometimes we we can miss this, right? Because we just open our Bibles and just kind of read right through them. And we forget that some of these apostles or some of these authors are living in different contexts and they're writing letters to different churches at points. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind because if we keep that in mind, then we realize, oh, God is actually quite gracious here to raise up a James to say to these Christians, uh, you cannot live like the world and claim that you are right with God. Uh, if you do so, then I have some, we're going to get at the very heart of this. And yet James is going to use the language of works to do that. So all that to say, I completely understand how it can feel like, oh, why couldn't have God just kept the same tone or the same uh, vocabulary throughout? But at the same time, you know, a minute ago, we emphasized the unity of Scripture. At the same time, if we understand uh, its diversity in terms of the church spread globally and the way that uh, Jesus' disciples are trying to reach different pockets of the church with different challenges, well, then we realize, oh, this is actually a gracious gift of God. Mm. And uh, I would say to our listeners, um, God may do this with you too. There may come a moment in your ministry um, with one church in which uh, they are clinging to their works as if those works then perhaps in part justify them before God. And you will need to speak uh, in a very Paul-like way. And then 20 years, you may be at a different church and realize that, well, these people have a vain confidence in, in, in their faith when uh, they claim to be right with God. But meanwhile, they are indulging in all kinds of immorality. How am I going to address them? Well, I would encourage you to read the book of James. <laughs> yeah. And it's such a helpful reminder because as we hold to Scripture's inerrancy and authority and unity, as you've already said, uh, we can sometimes almost go too far and start to treat it like a theology textbook with, you know, with the kind of constraints and uh, rules that we might impose on a systematic theology today that isn't necessarily how the Bible is trying to operate. Um, okay, maybe another question about the Bible. So we've already mentioned Paul in Romans 3.28. Uh, where Paul teaches that Christians are justified by faith and not by works of the law. And a question I think that many Christians eventually come to as they think about this more deeply is, why isn't faith considered a work? And maybe the impression can be that, okay, faith is that, that one thing that we do that actually does lead to our justification that we are allowed to do. It's the one work that's like approved and for some reason not considered a work, even though we're doing it. So how would you answer that question? Well, I think this is where uh, systematic theology can be so helpful to us, and it can actually save us from a lot of pain and a lot of misconceptions, um, a lot of missteps. When we talk about justification, we need to understand that the basis on which we are justified, in which we are declared right by a holy God, is external to us. It is found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so this is why we can uh, wave that banner of solus Christus and say it's in Christ alone. So this goes back to our earlier conversation of are we in Adam or are we in Christ Jesus? So uh, that said, when we talk about justification, I know sometimes we use the more colloquial language of we are justified by faith. 
And I think I understand what people mean by that. But if we want to be more accurate, we might say, well, we are justified by grace. Uh, we are justified by grace. And how's that? Well, we are justified by grace because we're justified on the basis of the righteous, of the whole work of Christ. Now, if that's the case, well, then faith isn't the basis on which we are justified as if faith itself becomes some type of work. Rather, faith is instrumental. It's through faith in Christ that we are then uh, right with God. In other words, if the righteousness is not our own, as if even our own faith is a type of righteousness, but if the righteousness is external to us, if it is Christ himself and his perfect work, if that's the case, then our faith is the means by which we then receive and that's a key word, right? We're, we are not, this is not a, a type of merit, but a reception hmm. of Christ's perfect righteousness. And so this is why when we talk about justification, we might be a little bit more technical and say, well, we are justified by grace alone, on the basis of the work of Christ alone, through faith alone. And so this is why many of the Protestants of the past have said, well, faith doesn't become a work itself, but it is the instrumental cause through which God declares us right with him. This is really important because I think that this became definitive, a very defining feature of a Reformed soteriology. And so the Reformed tradition entered into a lot of controversy over this point to say that faith should be instrumental uh, rather than turning faith into a type of work by which we are justified. That's so helpful and, and such a great illustration of uh, the value of some of the theological precision that can come as we study these things, as we take the time to invest in learning about how Christians through the centuries have helped to think about and uh, articulate the truths that the Scripture teaches us. Let's take a, a big step back and ask a foundational question. How is justification just? How is it right and just for God, as we've already established, a holy, righteous God who, who reigns over all things, how is it right for him to declare us, those who are unrighteous, to just say that we are righteous, even though he hasn't actually changed us inside yet? Uh, he will. But we're not. he's not doing that, as you've already said, on the basis of some change that he's actually worked in us. It's based on Jesus, something something someone else did. So how, how is that fundamentally a just thing for God to do? Well, I really like the question and appreciate it because uh, this is the very question I think Paul has in his mind in Romans chapter 3. I think today we often come to this doctrine very entitled. Maybe we don't want to admit it, but we think, of course, God would be so gracious to justify us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are so we are so entitled, and as if it's as if it's something God must do or would have to do. We have to remember, as uncomfortable as it may be to hear this, we have to remember God is absolutely holy, and if He saved nobody. He would remain just because we are the ones who are our sinners. We are the ones who are in Adam. We are the ones, every one of us, as, as the psalm says, no one is righteous, no, not one. Well, when we think of it from that perspective, well, then the question of how is God just is a real question. How can God remain just and accept condemned guilty sinners like us? That seems like that would actually violate his very character. And Paul addresses this in Romans chapter 3, and he goes right to where we just were when he says, uh, look at Christ. He is the propitiation for your sins. And Paul says at one point, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, but all are justified, all are justified by his grace as a gift. And then he says, through the redemption uh, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put for as a propitiation by his blood, to be received. There's that language again, right? To be received by faith. But then Paul, and you can see the nagging question lingering in his mind, but then he, he raises this issue. He says, well, in his mind, he's wondering, how can God be just to do this? 
And he says, well, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What is Paul saying? I think what Paul is saying here is that apart from Jesus Christ, apart from his propitiation, as Paul says, his atoning work, the problem remains. How can God then be just to then justify the ungodly? But if Christ substitutes himself and becomes that propitiation by his own blood, now there is a basis on which God can declare us right with him. And at the same time, he remains just. Perhaps we could even put it stronger than that to say God's justice, justness itself is accentuated and highlighted and brought to the front of our minds by means of the blood of his own son. So this is one of the reasons why when we look at Jesus Christ, there's that famous painting in which Luther is standing in the pulpit and the people are on the other side and he's pointing them to the cross as Christ is crucified. Well, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Because it's on the basis of the cross that we see God, his righteousness and his everlasting mercy kiss one another. Uh, rather than there being a conflict in Christ, we can actually be received into the very presence of God who remains just and yet is gracious to, towards us in uh, the righteousness of his own son. That's such a helpful explanation. Um, I do wonder, though, someone might hear all of that, and and maybe uh, if we were to transpose this into like a, a human courtroom that we might be familiar with, I mean, think of a judge. God is the judge there. I think to us, if there was a, a person on the stand who was declared guilty, found guilty in a court of law, and then someone from the crowd said, you know, wait, I volunteer, I'll take his punishment, and if the judge were to say, okay, sure, we can do that, you can take his punishment, and then he's going to go free, I think we would all pretty rightly stand up and object and say, that's not justice, that's not right. Uh, someone else can't bear the penalty that man deserved, otherwise justice has not been done. So how is it different? What, what's different about uh, what we're seeing yeah. at the cross with Jesus that makes that actually a just transaction? Hmm. Well, you know, that type of objection is not one that doesn't resonate with folks today. Uh, you think of the rise of uh, the new perspective on Paul, uh, N.T. Wright is very famous, or maybe infinite, infamous for others, for voicing that, that type of objection, saying, oh, it's just like a courtroom, and, and you can't have the judge doing that. And then he's been also very critical of you know the doctrine of imputation, portraying this as if this is, uh, you know, some type of gas that's floating through the courtroom. You know, that type of, char of uh, caricature, I would argue. Um, and so there's been many objections uh, at this point. How do, what do we say? How do we respond? Uh, does this undermine God as just or the justification of the ungodly? Well, I think the first thing we have to understand is this is no ordinary courtroom. <laughs> mm. Yes, certainly there are parallels so that we can understand it to our experience of a human courtroom in which there's a judge and there's a guilty person and so on. But we also have to remember this is God we are talking about. And so this can't, this is a type of heavenly courtroom that is incomparable mm. in a sense. Now, if that's the case, then things look very differently. On what basis can the judge declare his just? Well, uh, like you mentioned, it is on the basis of someone substituting, but it's not just anyone substituting themselves because you're right and this is this gets the problem of the storyline of the bible you hear this longing in the old testament who's going to come who can possibly come and uh, be our representative be our new adam and i think we begin to see to the point where we are fatigued that mm. whether it's moses or whether it's david they too are not the man uh they are not the savior to do it all that to say when we come to jesus christ i can't help but think of Athanasius in his little book called On the Incarnation. What a great book this is, what a classic, because when we come to Jesus Christ, we see someone 
who actually meets the very qualifications needed to make this great happy exchange possible. And what are those? Well, on the one hand, uh, this, this is the very mystery of the incarnation, right? On the one hand, uh, this is the only begotten Son of God. Uh, as the Mycene Creed says, he is true God of true God. And how necessary that is, uh, because if he's not, then on what basis can he actually accomplish for us an everlasting, eternal life in God? He can't. And at the same time, he's not only true God of true God, but he is true man. In other words, uh, in the language of, of John's gospel, he's been made flesh. And we don't have to get into all of the intricacies of how to articulate that, you know, the hypostatic union. But the point is, uh, the point is that we now actually have the Savior uh, who represents us. He uh, not only in his person, he not only is a uh, true God, but he is true man. And as therefore our second Adam, he can substitute himself in a way that represents us. Now, that being said, now all of a sudden, we have a very different scenario. This is not just anyone. No, no one else could do this but him. And so uh, now the very righteousness by which he lives and dies and rises from the grave, well, now that can be imputed to us so that God can count us, count us justified with him. And like you mentioned a minute ago, that then has so many implications then for what it means to be in Christ. Uh, not only are we justified so that our status is righteous in Christ, but we also then, upon faith in Christ, we also then are being ushered into sanctification so that the Holy Spirit is then conforming us into the image of Christ. So not only do we go from being condemned to declared righteous, but we also go from being having a corrupt nature to being regenerated and then sanctified so that we are actually being conformed in our person to Christ Jesus. So all that to say, it is an extraordinary event, one that is unlike any other. And so we can't simply apply the same rules to it. Mm. Uh, if we could, then it wouldn't be extraordinary and we wouldn't have the type of justification that we have, the type that scripture describes. Uh, Matthew, thank you so much for helping us today to uh, do that a little bit better as we've talked about this important doctrine of justification. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me. Grateful for all you guys do. That was Matthew Barrett on justification. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, The Doctrine on Which the Church Stands or Falls, Justification in Biblical, Theological, Historical, and Pastoral Perspective. Pick up a print copy of the book for 30% off, or get the ebook for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org slash plus. For more audio content like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a review. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.